Well, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for organizing such a nice conference. Um, um, okay. Oh, yes, he's telling me that I should set the timer for 30 minutes. Okay. Um, this is, here's a picture of uh, Purdue University. It's in the state of Indiana, in the U.S. Uh, it's a great place for doing research on density functional theory because it was founded by John Purdue in 1869. <laughs> so uh, on this slide, I want to uh, go over um, uh, a few exact reformulations of density functional theory. Uh, the first three we've learned in, in this workshop. Uh, Cohen Sham DFT, where the quantity to approximate the exchange correlation energy and, and then you get the exchange correlation potential as the derivative. Uh, using the uh, uh, notation of your conic, uh, you generalize Cohen Sham, you make a choice for your S, and then you approximate your. Uh, R functional, the rest functional, and the functional derivative gives you the, the rest potential that goes into the uh, generalized Kohn-Shank equation. Orbital 3 DFT is also an exact uh, way of, of doing uh, ground state DFT. You approximate the entire, uh, if you can, good luck, uh, uh, non additive kinetic energy functional, um, and then you can get the density. Uh, uh, without uh, involving orbitals, you also need to approximate exchange correlation energy uh, then to, to get the energy. And a fourth uh, exact reformulation of ground state DFT is partition DFT, and you may not have heard about that. Uh, uh, there you approximate the partition energy, uh, but the partition energy is, is an implicit function of the density, uh, and uh, you should think of it as a, as a function of a set of fragment densities. The, the partition potential is the functional derivative of the partition energy with respect to any of these fragment densities. Uh, so this is how it works. You uh, split your external potential into a sum of fragment potentials. Uh, and then you do something that, that will come next. Uh, and in the end, you get a set of fragment densities that add to the correct molecular density. Uh, the correct if you are using the correct exchange correlation function. Uh, what it is, it's a constraint minimization. You minimize EF defined as the sum of the fragment energies uh, where the fragment energies are given by this ensemble expression uh, uh, following uh, the expression that we know the exact functional follows for a fractional number of electrons um, from a PPLD. Um, or you can turn this into an unconstrained minimization of EF. Uh, so, 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 I, I, so you do this minimization subject to this constraint right here, or you do an unconstrained minimization of capital G. Uh, and when you write it like this, you can think of the partition potential as the Lagrange multiplier that guarantees that this constraint is subject. And then in the end, you get this set of fragment densities that you simply add is that as if they were non-interacting non -interacting fragments uh, to get the correct density. And then each n alpha is the ensemble ground state density of, in general, a non-integer number of electrons p alpha plus nu alpha in the external potential p alpha plus bp. So you see the meaning of this partition potential is that you add it to each of the b alphas um, uh, and each of these Fragment density is, is a ground state density in the alpha plus BP, and note that there's no alpha dependence on from BP. Uh, so a, a way that I like to think about this is with an analogy with Kohn-Sham DFT. Uh, and the analogy works like this. So everywhere you find the word electron in Kohn-Sham DFT, replace it by the word fragment, and the other way around. So Kohn-Sham DFT maps the system of interacting electrons to a system of non-interacting electrons with the same ground state density. In partition DFT, you map the system of interacting fragments 
to a system of non-interacting fragments in the same ground state density. For a given choice of partitioning, you decide where your nuclei go. So once you make that choice, the mapping is one to one. Um, and here, so since we need to connect with the pedagogical docs, Akiron uh, derived or wrote down maybe on the blackboard this expression from Konshan DFD. The difference between the true energy and the sum of the orbital energies is the hard to exchange correlation energy minus this term here. Where ES is the Konshan energy is the sum of TS plus VS dot N. Well, here's the analog in, in partition DFD. This is the ground state energy of the fictitious system of non-interacting electrons. So remember the analogy. In partition DFD, we have here the ground state energy uh, for a system of non-interacting fragments. Um, and uh, is equal to the partition energy. You see the analogy and the partition potential, right? So it's a nice formula. OK, let's continue with the analogy. It's the simplest system of, uh, to illustrate uh, DFT for two, in two interacting electrons, right? So, uh, one fragment, two electrons, and Kieran drew the, the case of the helium atom, the Kronchan potential and the exact uh, Coulomb potential for the helium atom. By analogy, the simplest system of interacting fragments to illustrate partition DFT is one electron, two fragments, right? It's, it's, uh, that's the H2 plus molecule. Uh, so here it is. Um, half, this is a picture of half an electron in one of the two nuclei, uh, and you do partition the FD, uh, and in the end you get this, you can see this slightly polarized fragment density, it's the ground state density of 0.5 electrons in the nuclear potential of the hydrogen atom plus the partition potential that looks like a well, it's, it's well in between the two nuclei that just pulls density towards the bonding region. Uh, you recover the exact ground state density by simply adding those densities. And the, the energy, obviously, is also exact. But I put these two numbers here to emphasize this top number was obtained by solving the Schrodinger equation for one electron in two nuclei. Right? But to get this number, we never solved the Schrodinger equation in two nuclei. It's only calculations on fragments that self-consistently generate the partition potential. And, and in the end, you get the exact density, therefore, the exact thing. So why are we doing this? Maybe you've already uh, seen some, some uses for this. First, to connect with, with my talk, uh, pedagogical talk, is to provide a solid foundation to chemical reactivity theory. We are doing calculations on fragments and extracting calcul uh, properties of the molecule. Remember that the goal of chemical reactivity theory is to, uh, uh, to get properties of a molecule using as input properties of the reacting molecules. Uh, but also to improve the accuracy of approximate DFT calculations and to improve the efficiency of approximate DFT calculations as other fragment methods. Uh, that's, that's the reason why many of the fragment methods and embedding methods are developed. So let's start with a quick, uh, uh, so a few words about that. Um, so this slide here, going back to the other, the, my initial slide. None of these other methods, when uh, when the main variable is the total molecular density, can be used as an appropriate framework to do chemical reactivity theory, because, well, again, the, the goal of CRD is to get properties of the molecules from properties of the fragments. And if you have no definition for, for, for the fragments, then that's, that's hard to do. Um, so remember the, this ground potential G of my previous slide. Uh, if the minimum exists, then uh, DG, T omega, these are the occupation numbers, the fragment occupations. You can derive uh, this, this equation, and if you define now the chemical potential of the fragment uh, as all of these, which you see is the difference between the P alpha plus 1 and the P alpha plus this term that includes the partition potential, then you see that you get chemical potential equalization. So at the minimum that we're finding for partition DFT, the fragments 
have the same chemical potentials uh, and equal to the chemical potential of the model. That is, the electronegativities are all uh, equal. And you can see that I think in my next slide, yes, at the PDFT solution for a model system, both fragments, the left and the right fragment, have the same uh, asymptotical decay. Um, also, uh, remembering the Fukui functions, uh, remember the problem we were having with the definition of Fukui functions due to the derivative uh, continuity. Well, the Fukui functions now um, are given by an identical expression, but now these fragment densities um, have the influence, the effect of the partition potential. So, uh, I think I'm going to uh, skip through this and come back to this if there's time in the end. Well, maybe this one. Uh, I want to show you my student Kelsey Nipenegger and Jonathan, Jonathan Lapsiger um, managed to, to get the solution for the partition equations for, uh, for this system. So uh, consider these as two fragments. Uh, the first fragment is a, uh, is, uh, you can think of modeling a metal. It's just a step. And you have it's semi-infinite. You have infinitely many electrons here, and what we fix is the Fermi atom. The other fragment is an atom that is a distance r from the from the surface. And when the atom is infinitely far away from the metal, we have this uh, step. These are non-interacting electrons, so uh, but this is still uh, clear that you get stepwise. Uh, uh, behavior for the number of electrons on the atom as a function of uh, the chemical potential that in this case is simply the Fermi energy. Uh, but we can solve partition theory uh, as you approach the atom to the metal uh, and you reach chemical potential, uh, chemical potential equalization uh, and well you see that the result is that the staircase has smoothed out it looks as if it were a finite temperature calculation or something, but it's not. It's a finite distance calculation using partition theory. Um, okay, so why do I say that we can use partition DFT to improve the accuracy of approximate calculations? And the strategy uh, that we follow is to calculate the non-additive, non-interacting kinetic energy exactly and approximate the non-additive hard rate exchange correlation, where these non-additive pieces are defined here. These are the, you know, when you write everything in Cohen-Chan language, these are the contributions to the partition energy. Uh, and I write here the non-additive kinetic energy in detail, uh, including uh, these ensemble components, and, and we use this spin that is this, uh, for the fragments. So Fi alpha stands for the ensemble components. So let's go back to the nice uh, lecture by White explaining the delocalization and static correlation errors again, H2 plus and H2. Remember that this is, I don't know where to point. <laughs> go back here, sorry. Remember error due to fractional charges and error due to fractional spins. Uh, blue is the LDA. I think uh, John mentioned in his stuff that no one in chemistry does LDA anymore, uh, but we probably uh, do LDA to as a proof of principle that if you have an approximation that works more or less okay for the fragments, and the problem really arises as, as you stretch, as you stretch the bonds, uh, then we can approximate the partition energy in a way that will fix this error. Uh, so the, the green shows our approximation that I'll show you in a second. Uh, and you see that it largely fixes both delocalization and static correlation with the same functional. And maybe I should stress that the, the spin is uh, zero throughout. So there is no spin symmetry breaking because each fragment has half electron up, half electron down. Uh, throughout. So here's the approximation. It's, it's very simple. And the reason that, that we can develop this approximation is because we understand the origin of the errors uh, following the explanations by, by Whitehouse. So we know what we need to do. 
And I guess the exact constraint that we're satisfying is that the partition energy should go very simple, but it's an exact constraint that the partition energy uh, should go to zero as you stretch. And this is not satisfied by the LDA when you use our uh, ensemble formulation. Uh, so we impose that by simply multiplying the non-additive exchange correlation energy by a functional of the set of fragment densities um, that we came up with. Uh, it's, it's a very simple uh, idea. There's a factor of two that we didn't try to, to make uh, better, but we clearly could. Uh, and, and there's also here a correction to the non-additive heart rate uh, that's needed. Here I wanted to show you some pictures of this overlap function. Uh, I think earlier this morning uh, in was it Adrian's talk or maybe John's talk, there was a comment on the need to estimate the overlap between two argon atoms that are uh, nearby. Um, but how do you estimate an overlap between the two densities when you have two atoms at interacting distances? Uh, you need some method to do that, and I, I would think that this is, this is a natural method to get unambiguous uh, densities for the fragments. Also in, in Lear's talk, uh, having uh, the ionization energy and the electron affinity of donor and acceptor when they were at interacting distances. Uh, but ionization energy and electron affinity are the properties of donor and acceptor when they are infinitely far apart. Uh, when they are at finite distances, I would imagine that something like this could be uh, helpful also for, for the problem of uh, dissociating, ground state energies dissociating. Uh, so this is how the overlap that, that we have looks like. And I guess for, for this term, the correction to the non-additive heart rate, one has to sit down and look at how it works. Uh, but basically, for a molecule like lithium-2, uh, it's, it's zero, because you don't need to correct anything from the non-additive heart rate. But for a molecule like lithium-2+, plus, where you have delocalization error, you need to make sure that you cancel those incorrect contributions from a two-electron two ensemble from one fragment interacting with the three-electron ensemble from the other fragment, and vice versa. So here it is for lithium-2+, plus, and lithium-2 is the same, the same functional, and again using LDA for the fragments. And it's all self-consistent, and it looks very good to me. Here, so now I, I want to show some pictures uh, trying to justify that this is the right answer for the right reason, even though we may not care about the, the right reason for that. So here, this is how the partition potential looks like. This is the one that reproduces the LDA. use this partition potential, you, you simply reproduce the LDA density. And you see that all components, kinetic exchange correlation and heart rate nuclear, are significant at the bond midpoint. This zero is in between the two nuclei. So here you have one nucleus, and over here you have the other nucleus. So zero is in between, and they are all important. Um, the fragment densities, this is the log the log of the densities, and that's why they look funny. Um, for the two ensemble components, you have two electrons with spin up, and one electron with spin up, and you combine them half and half. Uh, this is how, how they look like. Um, but when you apply the overlap approximation, you see that when you focus on the blue lines, that's lithium two, you see that, that the overlap uh, decreases at any separation. So, so, they, so the fragment densities are, are coming apart, and that is because if you look, if you do an inverse calculation, you find the chrono chunk potential corresponding to the density, the self-consistent density that you get from the overlap approximation, 
then you get this creep in between the two nodes. So let me explain this. So if you add these two, this is the contribution uh, to the fragment energies from exchange correlation, and this is the partition energy. So if you add these two, you get the exchange correlation potential for, for uh, the two. Uh, and you see that the exchange correlation contribution to the partition potential has this fact in the two nuclei that is known to be present in the exact current sham potential and absent from the approximate LDA. So you see how dramatic the difference they are the LDA and the volume of the LDA. Okay, so that was something on accuracy. Now, to make these calculations efficient, we really have no alternative but to use uh, an approximation to the non-analytic, non-interactive kinetic energy function. Um, and that is uh, the difficulty. So the, the obvious way of approximating this term is by taking an approximation to the non-analytic, non-interactive kinetic energy function and plugging it for the whole system and plugging it also for the fragments. Like, it's the same approximation for both. Um, so, uh, th th there's, you know that, that uh, the orbital 3D has not developed uh, enough uh, because it's just really hard to come up with accurate approximations, but this is different because we, we don't want to approximate the whole TS. We want to approximate the non-additive TS, much smaller. So there's hope that, that even um, through the approximations that we have currently available uh, might work. But that's not the case. So let me go back to lithium 2. And uh, this is the exact partition potential that reproduces the LDA density. And these are the approximate uh, kinetic energy functions that we tried that are available in the UXC. And you see that they are all terrible. Um, in fact, it reminded me a little bit about the story of uh, what was it inverted potential of PDB. Because if you take the one, one light cycle potential and you multiply it by minus one half for no good reason, you get you get something close to the correct kinetic part of the potential. Um, but that's a good reason. That's a good reason. <laughs> And I think it's actually the analogy is not too bad because I'm also going to argue in a second that the one by sucker is good in some, in some sense uh, when, you, when you stretch the model that we're, we're going. So but, but before let me show you some number just to emphasize this one and make a, a little joke that's, that's kind of serious. Uh, the, um, this is the exact value for the non uh DS, 0 0.0048. To at equilibrium. And these are the values that you get from all other functions. You see, they are most, most of them are negative, one of them is positive. But the best one is setting it to zero. Just for this case. Um, also, if, uh, I'd like to. Is that an empirical zero or. It was fitted. <laughs> but you see that uh, oh, something else we have with partition DFT is a nice framework to test approximations for kinetic energy functions because the answer is unique. There's a, there's a unique correct answer, uh, and that is 0 0.0048. That's a limitation of other embedding methods that are there. Uh, so we can test functionals for the non additive uh, non interacting kinetic energy using this. This framework. <coughs> and so uh, we are working on that, and I want to show you some important results for, uh, for, for lithium 2 and sodium 2. Uh, here we are using LC94 in red, it's one of the best approximations, well, it's one of the mostly used approximations in embedding for, for, for non additive PS. The exact we cannot see because it's under the green, that's our one for. And, uh, and it's inspired by, by this plus. So here we have the kinetic contribution to the partition potential at the 
equilibrium and when you're stretching the body. In black, you have the exact. And one light sucker that looked terrible that you have to multiply by minus a half is pretty good, it's excellent uh, for the stretch molecule, at least for 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 for, re, for an important uh, region of the molecule. Um, and Thomas Fermi is not that bad at equilibrium. So our the obvious thought was uh, combine Thomas Fermi with one Weizsacker, uh, but we need a switching function, but in particular, the, the, the switching function is, is really a, a position as we stretch. Uh, so, so here it is. Uh, we have just two, two proposals for switching from one Weizsacker at uh, long separations, Thomas Fermi and short separations. And in one case, it's a function of the densities and the magnetization. In the other case, it's a function of just the density, but then you have one empirical parameter that, that was that was treated and this is the, the function that, that we used after trying by many other forms. And uh, well it's it's uh, that's what we have done. Yeah, so I think I'm going to stop uh, now. Uh, so I wanted to advertise four recent uh, publications that are related to this. Uh, first, this is a tutorial uh, that's pretty long that you might enjoy. It's the uh, main body of work from Daniel Jensen, who's now working with uh, Aquila in San Diego, uh, on numerical methods for the inverse problem of DFT. So these are all examples in one D for how to do the inversions, uh, going from the density to the potential. Uh, the review uh, that, that Kieran uh, mentioned yesterday for uh, that, that also has a section on how this density driven errors and functional driven errors relate to partition DFT. Um, this paper has all the reference data that we calculated for the non energy, and that's the data that we're using to test our, our functionals and uh, an application on the water diamond. Um, more on the chemical reactivity side. So to summarize, uh, partition DFT reformulates DFT in an exact way, and it allows us to develop chemical reactivity theory, uh, improve the accuracy of approximate DFT calculations, uh, and for that, we need to find approximations of general applicability for the normality exchange correlation function. And there is a path uh, towards improving the efficiency uh, also, uh, but for that we do need approximation for the non additives when interacting with the energy, which is a very challenging approach. And we must speak up, and I'd like, like to thank my students who did the work and the U.S.
table that you can formulate right entity contribution, non entity contribution. Yes. I can then I use the same formula for function by just instead of writing them to substitute the uh, elements. Yes, but then there must be many possibilities. Right? So no, no unique answers. In a way, the burden. There are no way to see the problem is what you said, except we select from the many possibilities that you have in mind, we select the one that minimizes the sum of the elements of the right. Hand. So but yeah, what about the many and they can and the other other question? We've done uh, many problems but only in one week. Uh, so, so uh, it's not only for, for real modules, we only don't like economics to write. But uh, do we have overlap? And, 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 and we don't have uh, any overlap for the modules. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. what's next? So, I have a question about the formula aspect of this. So, if I understand correctly, this is rooted in conjunctive in the sense that. Isolated fragment is described by function theory, and also your partition potential is multiplicated. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. In that case, if I choose to describe each fragment individually by one of the generalized function methods, can I construct a generalized partition potential? And if yes, will it still be multiplicated or will it become non -multiplicative? So if you do generalize condition, no, I think I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that the partition potential will simply be added to your D R as a, um, but the orbitals that that you get that's going to be S will. Okay, now I can to say that it's, it's an easier problem to solve. Uh, what I meant is, is that since it's much smaller than the total TS, um, it's, but it's harder to approximate. It's, um, I don't know if it's harder to approximate uh, because we can think, try to think of non-decomposable approximations, for example. So, Something that approximates directly the S non add, even though the exact unknowable functional must be decomposable. Uh, perhaps, well, perhaps so. some ideas for non decomposable approximations. Uh, this for the case of uh, non covalent uh, timers. I have some pictures I can turn later for uh, rare gas timers, um, but for covalent, covalently bonded modules, seems. So, so with that kind of mind, then do you think there is efficiency and complication that it makes it can be complicated? But so what do you mean? You mentioned that the advantage of that you can speed up calculation. That depending on the Normally, you have energy in the energy, but with whatever you have available for the normal energy, is that good enough? Well, it's good enough if you judge by the number of papers that use embedding ESD now using the approximate to the energy that we have. Um, so, so it's good. I mean, many people are using embedding subsystem DFT, embedding of various kinds. Using LC94 and other approximations for the dynamic energy and getting sometimes useful results. Uh, so we could do exactly the same thing in particular DFT, but it, it, so it also helps us as a framework to the 
So it's all self-consistent. Exactly. But what once I, I want to know is how you assure that you have uniqueness of you know, because this partitioning could I'm afraid that through different partitioning you get the same um, There are many there are usually many test bits that are going to be the same the same test. Many the same well, we do because we are we are finding the unique set of private identities okay. that give you the density and minimize the sum of the dynamics of the practice. But 
we are making uh, progress, and we, we have some, some uh, I referenced one. Here, this is for the water diner. And I think that, yes, this is for the water diner. And I didn't talk about it uh, here because we fixed the occupation to 18 electrons on each one. So it's not really partitioned you see, because we're fixing 18 electrons over for both monitors and hoping that there's not much charge transfer in the water diamonds. That's what we need to talk about. Um, but um, we are working towards doing this you know, morning. Would you please just go back to this slide? Uh, possibility uh, for one because we played a lot with uh, doing uh, upstairs partitions. Uh, so and one partition can be nothing because it's just nothing as your as your uh, potential. Uh, but assign some electrons. Thank you. 
Okay. Well, thanks for